Turn with me, please, to the Epistle of First John. In our study of the historical background of First John, we learned that the Apostle was writing this letter in response to the heretical teachings which were being propagated or had been propagated among his readers by some former members of their own assembly. By inspiration of the Spirit, the Apostle John said that these false teachers were not Christians at all, but rather they were against Christ, they were antichrists. We also learned that these antichrists were teaching the doctrines which later came to be known as Gnosticism. And this very prideful, exclusivistic group believed that salvation came through knowledge. They also embraced the dualistic philosophy which reasoned that everything material was evil, but everything immaterial or spiritual was good. To them, the material world was evil. There was no room in their philosophy for the incarnation of Christ. The idea of the bodily resurrection was repulsive to them, and they believed that sin was an activity of the evil body, the evil flesh only, while the good spiritual part of man was in no way contaminated by sin. These basic doctrines had been propagated among John's readers. They had caused much spiritual damage, and now John is writing this letter to refute those errors and also to restore to his readers the joy of their salvation. Now, with this historical background in mind, we began to look at the letter itself. And the first thing that we studied was John's prologue, found in the first four verses of chapter 1. Now, what subject did John address in this prologue? In the first four verses of this letter, what subject did John address anyone? The first four verses of First John chapter one. What subject did John address? Yes. Assurance of salvation. No. Assurance of salvation comes later. He tells us in verse thirteen of chapter five that that is the reason he's writing the letter in order that they may know they have eternal life. But what subject was addressed in the first four verses of chapter one? Come. The word of life. Okay. The word of life, or more specifically. Alright, and more specifically than that, okay, being made manifest, or the incarnation of Christ. That was the major subject, the very critical issue for John's readers. Their readers had been told that the good divine Christ could not take upon himself evil human flesh. They were taught that the divine Christ came upon the human Jesus at his baptism, but then departed from him before his crucifixion. And of course that meant that Christ did not die, but only the human Jesus died. A very critical issue, for if Christ did not die, then there is no salvation in Christ's death. So John doesn't waste any time with polite greetings. He gets right to the point and says, Jesus Christ is the eternal God. The eternal God who took upon himself human flesh. So contrary to your teachers, Jesus Christ is both God and man. Then beginning in verse 5, John begins to address another vital issue. These false teachers claimed to be in fellowship with God. They professed to know God. They claimed to have koinodia with God. And in verse 5, John begins to address this, uh, this claim by explaining what true fellowship with God really involves. Now, what's the first thing John says is characteristic of one who has true fellowship with God? Yes. Walking in the truth. All right. Walking in the truth, or as we called it, moral conformity, or moral likeness to the nature of God. In verses 5 through 7 of chapter 1, John says, Since God is light, one who is in true fellowship with God walks in the light. 
And if one is in darkness, his profession of having fellowship with God is a lie. And of course the word light here is used as a figure of speech. And is an echo of Jesus' earlier figurative use of this same word. And we learned that it was used by John to communicate that God is truth. So the first thing John says in addressing the Gnostic claim of having fellowship with God is that one who has true fellowship with God is characterized by a lifestyle of habitual conformity to God's revealed truth. That one who has true fellowship with God is characterized by a lifestyle of living according to the word of God. Then beginning in verse 8, John identifies another characteristic of one who has true fellowship with God. Now what is this second thing which characterizes one who is in fellowship with God? The first thing is moral conformity to the nature of God or walking in the truth. What is the second characteristic beginning in verse 8 of chapter 1? The second thing which characterizes one who is in fellowship with God. Yes. Okay, confession of sin. So the issue beginning in verse 5, or I'm sorry, beginning in verse 8, the issue is sin. In verses 5 through 7, John addresses the subject of true fellowship with God and the issue of moral likeness. But then beginning in verse 8 and going through verse 2 of chapter 2, John addresses the subject of true fellowship with God and the issue of sin. And in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1, he says that in order to have true fellowship with God, that one must not be like the Gnostic who denies his own sinful nature. That one must not be like the Gnostic that denies that he has committed any acts of sin, but rather one must confess his sin or one must agree with God's assessment of his sinful condition. But then another aspect is addressed in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2. Still dealing with the issue of sin, John says one who has true fellowship with God also deals with that sin through the only advocate for sinners, that is Jesus Christ. Now beginning with verse 3 of chapter 2, still addressing the claim of these antichrists to be in fellowship with God, John identifies a third characteristic of one who has true fellowship with God. From verse 3 through verse 6, he addresses the subject of true fellowship with God and the test of obedience. And I have this outline written on the board. True fellowship with God and the test of obedience. And we will look at this portion of Scripture, verses 3 through 6 of chapter 2, under the following headings. First of all, the test of obedience stated. Secondly, the test of obedience applied. And then thirdly, the duty of obedience enjoined. First of all, then, the test of obedience stated. Notice verse 3 of 1 John chapter 2. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now the first thing that we notice in this verse is that John is still addressing the issue of fellowship with God. Even though he does not use the word fellowship any place in this section, he is still addressing the issue of fellowship with God. Now, what word does John use in this verse which suggests that he is still speaking of fellowship with God? What word does he use in verse 3 which suggests that he is still speaking about the issue of fellowship with God? Yes. No. To know. The word is to know. Notice again verse 3. And hereby we know that we know him. John does not say, and hereby we know that we know about him. He's not speaking of simply having information about God. He says, and hereby we know that we know him. John is using this word know to indicate an intimate relationship with God. In this context, the word know is a synonym with the word fellowship back in verse 6 of chapter 1, where John says, if we say we have fellowship with him. 
So John is still addressing the same subject as he began, or that he began in verse 5 of chapter 1. Now the second thing we need to notice in this section, verses 3 through 6 of chapter 2, is that John is still addressing the claims of these false teachers. Now what is it that suggests that John is still addressing the claims of these false teachers? In verses 3 through 6 of chapter 2, what is it that John says that gives us the idea that he is still addressing the claims of these false teachers? Yes. Yes, Tom. Verse 4, he says, to one who says. Okay. Verse 4, the phrase, he that says. He that says, I know him. So the phrase, he that says, as I suggested last week, is John's way of introducing the claims of these false teachers. He's echoing something that they have said. Now, where else was John using this same language? Where else, at least similar language? Where else have we seen John using similar language? Yes. Verses 6 and 8, chapter 1. All right, verse, pardon me? If we say. All right, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with God. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin. And also verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned. So three claims of these antichrists have been introduced in chapter 1. Now in chapter 2, John introduces a fourth claim of these false teachers. Slightly different wording, but using the phrase for the same purpose. When he says in verse 4, he that says I know him. So John is not only speaking of the same subject of fellowship with God is also addressing the same claim by these false teachers. But then notice the word know, K-N-O-W, is used two times in verse 3. And hereby we know that we know him. Now we've already established that the second know is used to speak of more than just cognitive knowledge. It speaks of a personal relationship. The second no speaks of the same thing as fellowship in, the, in chapter 1. It speaks of what John will later call being in him or abiding in him. So it's certainly more than simple cognition. The second use of the word no is simply more than simple, simply knowing. But now as for the first no in verse 3, that is a different matter. This is simple cognition. It simply means to know something. John says one can know that he knows God. One can know that he has a personal relationship with God. One can know in the language of chapter 1 that he has fellowship with God. And after all that is what John said was one of the major reasons for his writing this letter. In verse 13 of chapter 5, he says, These things have I written unto you in order that you may know that you have eternal life. These false teachers had shaken the assurance of John's readers, teaching that salvation came through knowledge instead of through Christ, teaching that Christ, the divine Christ, did not die, teaching that there was no sin, especially in that part of man, that spiritual part of man that was really important. That kind of teaching resulted in the very foundations of their relationship with God being shaken. John's readers did not possess this, quote, Gnostic knowledge. So they began to question their relationship with God when they heard from the Gnostics that that's what one needs to have fellowship with God. So John writes, in order that they may know that they have eternal life. Now he has already implied ways that they may know, but now in verse 3 of chapter 2, he explicitly states a way that they may know. He says, and hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And hereby we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Now this word translated hereby in the Old American Standard and in the King James is a translation of two Greek words which literally mean in this. 
or as the New American Standard translates it, by this. So a, tra a better translation, I think, would be, an, a, at least a translation that we would be uh, better able to understand is this. And by this, we know that we know. And then John identifies the this. He says, by this we know that we know him, but now we have to know what the this is. And he identifies the this by saying, if we keep his commandments. And by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. And the word keep here is a present tense verb. Very important that we understand this. It's a present tense verb which speaks of habitual, ongoing, continual activity. It does not speak of a point action, of something that happens at one time, but speaks of something that is continuing, something that is habitual. It speaks of a practice of keeping his commandments. So here, by inspiration of the Spirit of God, John explicitly states that there is a test by which one can determine if he really knows God. There is a test by which one can determine if he really knows God. Now, it's very easy to claim that we know God, is it not? No one can read our hearts. And since the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it, sometimes we even deceive ourselves. But here John says there is a way that we can know. There is a way that we can know that we know God. He says, and by this we know that we know him, if we are keeping his commandments. Or another way of translating it, if we are keeping his commandments, we know that we know him. So the proof of being in fellowship with God is one's habitual keeping of God's commandments. The proof of being in fellowship with God is one's habitual keeping of God's commandments, not perfectly keeping God's commandments. John said of that back in verse 8 of chapter 1 when he says, If we, including himself, if we say we have, present tense, if we say we presently have no sin, we deceive ourselves. So John is not saying that the true Christian perfectly keeps God's commandments. But he is saying that one who truly knows God habitually keeps God's commandments. He is saying that one who really knows God as a practice of life, as a lifestyle in which he is consistently, habitually, as a pattern of life, living according to the word of God. That's what John is teaching here. This test of obedience is possible. Because one who does not know God cannot, as a pattern of life, practice the keeping of God's commandments. One who does not know God cannot, as a pattern of life, practice the keeping of God's commandments. Paul makes that very clear in Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 where he says, Because the mind of the flesh, that is the mind of the unregenerate man, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. A word of ability. It does not have the ability to be subject to the law of God, that is, the mind of the flesh or the mind of an unregenerate man. An unregenerate man cannot habitually keep God's commandments. So when there is the keeping of God's commandments, that is an evidence of the regenerating work of the Spirit of God. Evidence using Paul's words that the person no longer has the mind of the flesh. Well, in verse 3 we find the test of obedience state. And by this we know that we know him if we are keeping his commandments. Not we can know him by keeping his commandments. That's salvation by works and clearly not taught, clearly taught against in the word of God. So it is not that we know him by keeping his commandments. It's not that we know him as a result of keeping his commandments. John is saying, but we can know that we know him if we are keeping 
his commands. One of the fruits of our knowing him is that we follow him. That's one of the outworkings of our knowing him is that we follow him. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. They do. My sheep. A true sheep follows the shepherd. And here John is saying that one way we can know that we are true sheep is if our lives demonstrate that we are habitually following the shepherd. Then notice, after John clearly states the test of obedience in verse 3, beginning in verse 4, he applies this test of obedience. Notice what he says in verse 4 of chapter 2. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now, as I suggested earlier, in verse 4, John is again introducing one of the claims of these false teachers that he calls antichrist. In verse 6 of chapter 1, they claim to be in fellowship with God. In verse 8 of chapter 1, they claim to have no sinful nature. In verse 10 of chapter 1, they claim to have not committed any actual sins at all. Now in verse 4 of chapter 2, John introduces their claim to know God. And in response to their claim, John says, He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And again, the word keeps is a present tense verb. So the person being described here is one who professes to know God, but one whose lifestyle is not that of habitually, as a pattern of life, keeping the word of God. By inspiration of the Spirit. So this is a God-given test. John says that person, that person whose profession is, I know God, but whose life is not characterized by habitual keeping of the word of the God he claims to know. That person is a liar, and one in whom God's truth has not taken root. In simple language, the person described in verse 4 is not a child of God. That could not be any clearer. He that says, I know him, but does not practice the keeping of his commandments is a liar. And John is saying this for two reasons. First of all, he's seeking to expose the true identity of these false teachers. That's one thing he's seeking to do by saying what he's saying here. He's seeking to expose the true identity of these false teachers. These teachers had had a great influence upon John's readers. That's clear from the fact that John feels the need to write this letter. It was possible that some of his readers would embrace their heresy, having no concern for their sin. Instead of turning to Christ, they would seek a relationship with God through greater knowledge of some sort. And John knew that the end of that path was damnation. So here John is seeking to expose the true identity of these false teachers. In essence, John is saying to them, your teachers are liars. That's what he's saying. Your teachers are liars. They do not know God at all, and this truth, this knowledge that they claim to have, is not in them. Because if it were, they would be keeping God's commandments instead of living their lives as if there was no such thing as sin. Don't follow them. They are not who they profess to be. But also, in addition to exposing these very dangerous false teachers, a second reason John says what he does in verse 4 is that he wants, to, he, he wants to warn his readers who are in this same category. He wants to warn his readers who fit into this category, even though he has clearly stated this test of obedience in verse 3, he wants them to understand 
that the converse is also true. It's not just that we can know that we know him if we are keeping his commandments. It's also true that if we are not keeping his commandments, no matter what we say, we really do not know him and his truth is not, has not taken root in us. For any of the self-deceived among his readers, for any who thought all was well between them and God, even though they were still living in habitual rebellion against the revealed truth of God, for them he makes it very clear, under those conditions, your profession is a lie. But then for the sake of the true people of God among his readers, after applying the test of obedience in a negative way in verse 4, in verse 5, he applies it in a positive way. Notice what he says in verse 5 of chapter 2. But whosoever keeps his word, that is, whosoever keeps God's word, in him truly has the love of God been perfected. Hereby, or by this, we know that we are in him. But whosoever keeps God's word, in him truly has the love of God been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Now notice John has changed terminology here. He's changed terminology. Instead of keeping his commandments, now in verse 5 he says keeping his word. Instead of saying know him, in verse 5 he says in him. Now don't let the change in terminology throw you. John has not changed subjects. There may be some different nuances of meaning being introduced here, but the main point is still the same. And the point is that one who is in him, or one who knows him, or one who is in fellowship with him, evidences that fact by the habitual keeping of his word. That is the point. And again... Addressing the issue of assurance, John says, by this, that is, by this habitual keeping of his word, we can know that we are in him. But then notice John adds something new in this verse. John adds something new in this verse that he has not introduced before. He adds the fact that the Christian's keeping of God's word is an indication of not only that the Christian knows God, but also that he loves God. It's not only an indication that he has a relationship with God, but it's also an indication that he loves God. Notice the verse again. But whosoever is keeping his word, in him verily, or in him truly, has the love of God been perfected. Now, before we can understand what John is saying, we need to look for just a moment at this word, which is translated perfected. Because in our 20th century English vocabulary, the word perfected is probably not the best English translation here. When we hear the word perfected or perfect, we think of something which is flawless. We think of that which is without imperfections. Well, that's not what John means here. That's not the point that John is making here. The word translated perfected comes from the Greek word teleo, which means to come to an end, or to reach a goal, or to accomplish. It's from the same root word, root word as the word Jesus uses when he, said, when he says on the cross, it is finished. The exact same word that is translated Finished. It is finished. His saving work for his people was now complete. His saving work for his people was accomplished. His earthly ministry had reached its goal. Now John uses that same word in describing what keeping God's commandments is an indication of in the child of God. He uses that exact same word in describing what keeping God's word is an indication of in the child of God. He is saying what the habitual keeping of God's word indicates is that the person loves God. 
What the habitual keeping of God's word indicates is that the person loves God and that the habitual keeping of God's word indicates that the person's love for God has accomplished what love for God is supposed to accomplish. Why are we to love God? What is to be the end result of our loving God? So then we can go on and do our own thing and ignore God? No, the end result of our loving God, the goal of our loving God, is that we obey Him. In essence, John is saying what he will say later in chapter 5 and verse 3. Look over there just a moment. Notice what he says in 1 John 5, 3. He says, for this is love of God. For this is love of God that we keep His commandments. For this is love of God that we keep His commandments. That is certainly an echo of the words of Jesus in John chapter 14. In John chapter 14 in verse 21, listen to the words of Jesus. He says, He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. Two verses later, he says, If a man love me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that does not love me does not keep my words. That principle is what John is echoing back in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 5. In addition to the habitual keeping of God's word being an indication that one knows God, it is also an indication that one loves God. And of course, as John has already stated, and as Jesus stated in John chapter 14, the converse is also true. If we say we know him, and we are not habitually keeping his word, we are lies. If we say we love him, and are not habitually keeping his word, we are lies. Because the end, the fruit of knowing him and loving him is the same. That is, we will habitually keep his word. Now that John has stated this test of obedience in verse 3, and has applied this test of obedience in verses 4 and 5, in verse 6, he summarizes this section with what I have called the duty of obedience enjoined. Notice what he says in verse 6 of chapter 2. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. He that says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Now, the first thing we need to notice is the word ought. The word ought comes from the Greek word of phalo, which means to owe, or to be indebted to, or to be obligated to. It's a word that expresses duty. It's the word that is used in the parable of the unmerciful servant, who after being forgiven 10,000 talents, went out and found one of his fellow servants, who, and here's our word, who owed him less. The exact same word. He owed him less. That is the word that is translated off in our first John passage. It's the word that is used in Luke 17, verses 9 and 10. Listen to how it's used. Jesus says, Does the master thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded? Even so you also, when you shall have done all the things that are commanded you, you say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which it was our, and here's our word, we have done that which it was our duty to do. The exact same word, ophelo, expresses duty, expresses obligation. By inspiration of the Spirit, the Apostle John chooses this word to express how a professing Christian should live. 
He uses the same word. Notice how John identifies his professing Christian in verse 6 of chapter 2. He that says he abides in him. The word translated abides comes from the word which means to remain or to stay. And here it is, a present tense verb which describes continuing activity. So this person professes to be continually remaining in Christ. His profession is that he has an ongoing relationship with Christ. His profession is simply that he is a Christian. That person, says John, has an obligation. That person has an obligation. That person, says John, has a duty. He ought, that's the word, he ought himself to walk even as he walked. And as in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1, this word walk is a word which describes one's lifestyle. One's walk includes his attitudes, his speech, and his deeds. This person is to walk even as Christ walked. And this is not just a suggestion of the aged Apostle John. These words were chosen by the Spirit of God himself. Now that's important. All of God's word is God's word. All of the scriptures is God's word. And every word is chosen specifically by the Spirit of God for a purpose. There's no difference in this passage than with the rest of scripture. These words were chosen by the Spirit of God himself. And God says through his Spirit, through the Apostle John, one who professes a relationship with Christ as an obligation, as a duty which is laid upon him by the God that he said he knows. And that duty is to walk even as Christ walked. That's our duty. If we profess to know God, if we profess to be abiding in Christ, we have the obligation, we have the duty to walk even as Christ walked. Now, how did Christ walk? What were his attitudes? What was his speech like? What were his deeds? Simply stated, he walked in conformity to the Word of God. He walked in conformity to the Word of God. In John chapter 4, Jesus says, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. In John chapter 6, I am come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. And remember the night before his crucifixion? The night before his crucifixion, if he was ever going to rebel against the will of the Father, he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That was the attitude of the Lord Jesus. All that Jesus thought, all that Jesus said, and all that Jesus did was in conformity to the will and to the word of God. And John says, if we say we abide in him, we are duty bound to walk even as he walked. And again, even though Christ was sinlessly perfect, John is not saying we must be sinlessly perfect to have a credible profession. He's not saying that. He is still speaking of the Christian as one who is habitually keeping God's commandments. He is still speaking of one who is as a pattern of life keeping God's word. He is still speaking of one who is a true child of God as though his lifestyle is characterized by keeping God's word. And he is saying that it is our duty to be like Christ. To be like Christ in that we habitually govern our lives by the will and the word of God. And as he made it clear earlier, if our lives are not governed by the word of God, our profession of knowing God is a lie. Another very loud echo the words of Jesus in that very familiar passage in Matthew chapter 7. 
when he said, not everyone who says, there's the profession, not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father who is in heaven. An empty profession, not matched by a life of conformity to the word of God, is a lie and will gain us nothing in the day of judgment. So to his readers who had been led astray by these false teachers who professed to know God, to his readers whose assurance had been shaken by these false teachers, John clearly spells out how they may know that they are truly God's people, how they may know that their teachers are not God's people. First of all, he clearly states what we have called the test of obedience. He says in verse 3, In this we know that we know if we are keeping his commandments. We can be assured that we are a true child of God if we, as a pattern of life, habitually keep God's commandments. <clears throat> then with the test of obedience clearly stated, the second thing John does is to apply this test of obedience. He wants to make sure that they understand the ramifications of what he's saying to them. He wants them to understand. And you'll notice as we go through this epistle that over and over and over again, John repeats himself. This is not just because he was an old man and forgot that he has already said this once before. Because remember, this is the word of God. It is the spirit of God behind this old apostle repeating himself over and over and over again so that they would get the point. So after John clearly states this, this test of obedience, the second thing he does is to apply this, attest, this test of obedience. And negatively, he says, a profession of knowing God with a lifestyle of rebelling against God, is a lie. But then positively, he says, if one is habitually keeping God's word, that is evidence not only that he knows God, but that he loves God. And then in summary, John reminds his readers of their obligation as those who profess to have a saving relationship with Christ. One who makes such a profession, says John, is duty bound is obligated to walk even as Christ walked. Now, brethren, I don't know of anything in the Word of God that is any clearer. I know of nothing that is any clearer. In this passage, in these four verses, John knows only of two categories of people. There's only two categories of people found in these four verses. There are those who as a pattern of life are living according to the word of God. And there are those who as a pattern of life are not living according to the word of God. There are those who are habitually keeping God's commandments. And there are those who are not habitually keeping God's commandments. Only two categories. And the Apostle knows of no third category. All of those in this section, of course, are those who profess to know God. He's not speaking of those who make no profession at all. Here he is dealing with those, he is addressing those who make a profession of knowing God. And in response to those professions, John says very clearly, if one is not living according to God's word, his profession of knowing God is a lie. But if one is living according to God's word, his profession of knowing God is an expression of reality, is an expression of the truth, or even more simply stated than that, if we are habitually keeping God's commandments, we know God. But if we are habitually rebelling against God's commandments, we do not know God. So you see, it's really not as complicated as many want to make it is. And I suggest to you that these truths have not changed 
since John penned these words some 1900 years ago. Now I cannot see into the hearts of men any more than any of you can. But I have absolutely no question, absolutely no question, that in this very room are found the same two groups of professed Christians as are found in 1 John. The same two groups. Some of you in this room are the true people of God. I have no question about that. Your lifestyle of habitually keeping God's word proves it. It very clearly proves it. If you are not born of the Spirit of God, you could not, as a pattern of life, be keeping God's commandments. If you had not been born from above by the Spirit of God, you could not, as a pattern of life, be living according to the Word of God. That's very clear teaching from the Scripture. And I know that some of you have struggles with the issue of assurance. Because of your backgrounds, because of your own temperaments, or whatever reason, I know that some of you have struggles with the issue of assurance, just like some of John's readers. Some of you are not absolutely sure that you know God. Some of you are not absolutely sure that you have fellowship with God. Well, brethren, that need not be. That need not be. By inspiration of the Spirit of God, John says, we can know that we know Him. We can know that we know Him if we are keeping His commandments. And he's not talking about doing it perfectly. He's talking about doing it consistently. And if you can examine your patterns of living and honestly say, even though I am far from perfect, I am habitually living according to the Word of God as a pattern of life. I am living according to the Word of God. According to the inspired apostle, you have every reason to consider yourself to be in fellowship with God. But just as convinced as I am, that some of you are the true people of God. I am equally convinced that some of you who profess to be Christians are not Christians at all. And the reason I'm convinced of that is that you seem to live with very little regard for the Word of God. Very little regard for the Word of God. The Word of God says, Husbands, Love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Yet some of you professed Christian men as a pattern of life, emotionally, verbally, and even sometimes physically abuse your wives, but still feel very comfortable in calling yourselves Christian men. The Word of God says, Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands as unto the Lord. Yet some of you, as professed Christian women, as a pattern of life, squirm and chafe at almost everything your husband says, but still feel very comfortable calling yourself a Christian woman. The Word of God says, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture them in the chastening and admonition of the Lord. And some of you profess Christian fathers as a pattern of what? Either abuse your children or ignore your children. But still feel absolutely comfortable calling yourself Christian men. We can go on and on. The point is that John says that that is not consistent with being in a state of grace. It is not, absolutely not consistent with being in a state of grace. He that says, I know him, and does not practice the keeping of, my, of his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Nothing could be more clear. So I plead with you. Examine yourselves. There is evidence of the habitual keeping of the Word of God 
rejoice. Because you know God. But if there is no evidence of the habitual keeping of the Word of God, then give up your profession. It is a lie and it will do you no good on the day of judgment. But then turn from your rebellion and flee to Christ and begin serving Him with a determination to live consistently by His Word all of your days. For only then will there be any real assurance that you know God. Now, Father, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for the clarity of your word. You have not left us in darkness. Our Father, if there is any among us who are deceived, it is not because you have left them without a test. But you have clearly said to us, if we say we know you, but keep not your commandments, then we lie. For our Father, we plead with you that you would cause us to examine ourselves. That you would cause us with judgment day honesty to examine our lives. If we, from that examination, see that we are not as a pattern of life living according to your revealed truth, according to your word. Help us, our Father, to turn away from our empty profession, to turn to Christ, to flee to Him, to fall before Him and flee for His forgiveness and turn from our sin. Begin living according to Your will. But also, our Father, we thank You that You have in Your Word given us who are Your people a test that might give us the assurance that we are Your people. And knowing that there are not a few among us who have difficulties with assurance, we ask that you would bless them by causing them to examine their lives and then reveal to them if they are the true people of God that even though they are not perfect, they are living in a way that could be described as habitually keeping your word. Then our Father calls their doubts of assurance to go away. He calls them to rejoice in their salvation. And to be more determined to serve you all the days of them. Bless us, our Father, as we ponder these things. Use them for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.